I'm Chris Avina with American Outdoor News, and today we have the most unpolitically correct sheriff in uh, in America. Today we are so happy to have Sheriff uh, Wayne Ivey of uh, Brevard County, Florida. Sheriff, thanks for coming on. Man, thanks for having me, Chris. I, I appreciate being here and all you do for us, man. Thank you. I got to say, all this time I thought I was the most unpolitical, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, man, I'll tell you, Chris, uh, when, when people started calling me that, it was, uh, it was actually a badge of honor because uh, uh, right now we don't need political correctness. We need people to tell us what we need to hear and not what we want to hear. And so I, um, I, I, as I always tell everybody, I got, I got three jobs. Uh, that's to protect their citizens, our cops, and our Constitution. And that's what, uh, that's what we focus on. Well, we're here to support you on that because we believe in the same thing. And we want to thank you for everything that you do. We really appreciate it. Oh, absolutely, man. Thank you. Now, um, let's let's start off with stand your ground. Uh, sure. Florida's a stand your house, a stand your ground state. Uh, basically, castle doctrine where where I am in New York, you're not allowed to even protect yourself. Um, yeah. How do you find that uh, makes your job easier? In Florida, well, it, it really comes down to this. You know, when it goes down, when it happens, um, we're coming. We're mocked to with our hair on fire, but it's happening in seconds, and we're minutes away. So, what I've always told people is that my my job is to allow our citizens to be the first line of defense for them, for their family, those around them in the movie theater, those around them in church. And if we train them and prepare them to protect themselves they're able to be the first line of defense for them and all those folks they love so much. We're coming, we wanna get there as much as, as uh, anybody, but when it's happening, uh, a, a violent criminal will take your life in seconds. Mm -hmm. uh, we want our citizens to be prepared to stop that threat, to eliminate that threat. And we put on a class you know, here in, in Brevard County, it's called Self-Defense Through Tactical Shooting and Decision-Making. Our firearms instructors, those that teach our deputies how to be tactical, teach uh -huh. our citizens the same exact thing. Wow. And now is that just handgun or rifle? Do you teach everything? So we, we teach handgun um, uh, is the first, uh, there's multiple phases to our course, but the first phase was teaching people handgun. And what happened is we got such a great response. In fact, if you go to our website and try and sign up for that class, it's going to tell you it's full because the moment we open it up, it fills up pretty fast. In fact, so much to the point where I have to hold back a couple seats for people that I, I really want to get in the class. But what happened is we got such a great response to it. We offered it to other sheriff's offices throughout the state of Florida, the curriculum, the, the training model, everything. They started doing it. In fact, we just had a sheriff here, Bob Johnson, out of Santa Rosa County that uh, told his citizens, um, you know, we need you to be better practiced, better aimed, because they shot at a suspect that was breaking and doing a home invasion. Uh, what we want in Florida, and, you know, I think actually what every citizen wants is the ability to protect themselves. And in Florida, what we tell you, if you're a good person and you don't have a gun, we issue you one so you can protect yourself. Now, do you, uh, does this class also entail some hand-to-hand? -hand? It does, it's actually broken into four parts. So the first part is uh, self-defense through mental preparedness. We wanna avoid that conflict. If we can keep it from happening, maybe that's by making sure we're not in places we shouldn't be. Maybe that's by making sure our home uh, appears as a hard target, not a soft target, so that people aren't trying to break into it. But whatever it is, we want to avoid the conflict. Step two is um, our state attorney, who's a great partner with us, um, not like what you have in New York. Our state attorney here <laughs> comes out and actually teaches a class on self-defense, stand your ground, and castle doctrine, telling you what you legally can do to protect you and your family. The third part is, uh, in our class, you're going to shoot over 100 rounds through your gun, now, the problem is you have to take out a small loan to buy those 100 rounds in today's world, but yeah. um, we, we have them come out. They shoot over 100 rounds through their gun. And the last part is we put them on a shoot, don't shoot simulator. We actually put you on the Milo and let you see what it's like to be in those tense situations where um, lives are being taken in seconds and lives are being saved in seconds. So we, uh, we, we put our citizens through it and uh, we keep the cost very minimal so they can afford to come to it again. Our citizens are our partners out here. They are working with us to protect this community. So we want to make sure they're well prepared. So you you uh, fully endorse like a community watch or getting your uh, uh, absolutely we we uh, we push hard for neighborhood crime watches. We we tell our citizens if you see something, say something. 
Uh, we engage our citizens in all sorts of different capacities, even asking them to help us catch fugitives. We put wanted fugitives up on our social media sites um, uh, with our local media partners and our citizens engage with us. You know, Chris, the, the best thing about Brevard County is um, we're, we're surrounded by an incredible community that protects us just as much as we protect them. And it, it's a blessing, man. We have police officers from all over the country that are coming to Brevard County to work because they see that they have a sheriff that stands up for them. They see that they have a community that appreciates them and they're, they're coming here to live. How many uh, officers from New York are you taking from us? <laughs> man, actually, we're getting quite a few. In fact, we just had um, uh, Kelsey and William that just joined us. They're a husband and wife couple from NYPD. Um, couldn't take it anymore. They couldn't take the, the lack of law and order um, that's, that's being promoted in New York. And so they came down here to us and they love it. Um, in fact, they were just on uh, the uh, Ingram angle with uh, Governor DeSantis just uh, last week. Okay. Yeah, we, uh, we have a little bit of a lawless <laughs> society up here in New York. Um, how is the bail reform affecting you down there? I know it's, we're really taking a beating up here where um, they arrest somebody from a crime, he's out on the street hours later and he commits the same crime. <laughs> Yeah. So we're, we're not dealing with that here. Um, you know, as, as we have, we've made it very clear, if you violate the law in Brevard County, we are going to put you in jail. Um, you are, you are going to go to jail. Um, doesn't matter. We have zero tolerance for crime here. What I just watched happen in New York, where they basically decriminalized anything but a really violent crime mm -hmm. um, is unacceptable. You're putting people's lives at risk. And our job is to protect lives, not put them at risk. So when, when you take those, those criminals that um, are out there committing a crime they're not getting arrested for, it's just a stair step to the next one because crime will rise to the level of community will tolerate. There's no question about that. Absolutely. And to me, uh, bail reform is simple. You don't commit the crime, you don't have to put up bail. <laughs> that's, that's exactly right. And, well, you know, I tell people, I make it even more simple here. Uh, we put up uh, posters that show who was arrested for DUI, people that were arrested for um, uh, fugitives, any, any type of crime. And someone will always go on there and whine about, um, oh, well, you know, what, what about this person's rights? Well, here's a simple way not to be up on that poster. Don't violate the law. That's, that's the simple way. Obey the law. Let law and order be your guide. And you won't be on that poster. You won't have to be worried about being embarrassed. Well, you know, I grew up in a police family. Uh, my dad was on the job, my uncle, my cousin. Uh, so I grew up with a healthy respect for the law. Uh, and knowing what you and, and uh, your brothers and sisters go through every day, uh, yeah. you know, it's, it's a job where you don't know if you're coming home at night. Well, here's, here's what I think is one of the biggest problems. You have agency heads that are supposed to be cops mm -hmm. that have forgotten, A, what it's like to be out on the street where these men and women are out there protecting lives and keeping evil away from the door. They are more worried about keeping their job than they are about doing their job. And their job is to promote law and order. You got, you got law enforcement officers in New York. You, you got those in Portland, Seattle, all of these different areas that want to do their job, but the agency heads telling them to turn a blind eye to crime. And here I tell people, if you spit on our sidewalk, you put them in jail. So it's just a difference in philosophy. And, and quite frankly, when people start looking at where they want to live, Chris, the, the things they look at are, is it a safe environment? Mm -hmm. Are there good educational opportunities for, for my children? Yeah. Are there good job opportunities for, for me and my family? The housing market, how we take care of pets, um, all of those things, recreational activities. And what's happening is when you go to that first box of, is it a safe environment? These places that are turned a blind eye to crime, you can't check that box because it's not only safe, unsafe for the citizens, it's become unsafe for the law enforcement officers as well. Now, what are your four A's of survival? So, um, you know, we used to teach um, run, hide, fight. And after um, I was, I was uh, over at the Pulse nightclub the day it happened. Oh, wow. And uh, on the way back, it occurred to me that the people in the Pulse nightclub did exactly what law enforcement had coached them to do. Um, they ran. Many of them ran out the door. Um, some of them actually blocked the exit so that the shooter couldn't come out the door. But in doing so, they trapped others inside. They hid. They, they went into the bathrooms and hid. It was never supposed to be hide. It was supposed to be barricade. So they went into the bathrooms and they were, it was like shooting fish in a barrel in there because they were trapped. They had nothing to barricade with. Uh, 
And they, they never, you know, when we said run, hide, fight, we always said it that way, run, hide, fight. We never said fight, hide, run, or fight, run, hide. We always left it in the same thing. So um, they never got to fight. They, 49 of them died before law enforcement could come save them. That's so cool. on the way back, I started thinking about what, um, what could we do differently? What, could, what tools could we give our citizens that were going to save them in the event of an active shooter? And so we came up with the four A's of survival. And one, one of the things we do is we never give them in the same order. So, you know, we've been talking about um, uh, the right to protect yourself through the Second Amendment. So one of those is arm yourself. Mm -hmm. um, another one is um, avoid. We want to avoid the situation. Uh, also in that category of avoid, we mean get out of there. If it starts happening, get out, get to safety, run as, as hard as you can. Um, uh, awareness is another one. You know, what we've learned is that environmental awareness, um, understanding your environment, uh, knowing what's there, the exits, knowing uh, what, what resources are in there. You know, when we talk about um, understanding, it might be what tools are in here that I could use to defend myself. So when I go into a room, the first thing I'm doing is scanning that room to see, oh, there's a fire extinguisher over there. I might could use that. The, the American flag's over there. I could use the pole off of it. There's a knife on the table. What could I use if I don't have my gun um, to do it? And then attack. And uh, a lot of times what we see is uh, people don't understand that the active shooter doesn't anticipate you attacking them. Mm -hmm. I can show you example after example where those have attacked whether it was by physically fighting them or by shooting them or whatever that type of conflict became, they were attacking the shooter and in doing so eliminated the threat. So, you know, you only have to look as far as the flight on 9-11 where the passengers pulled together, stood shoulder to shoulder uh, to uh, attack the terrorists. And yes, lives were lost on that flight, but there's no way to ever put a number on the lives that they saved by, by their heroic actions. I agree. I agree. So basically, you're teaching them to be like um, trained military. Military, they well, they basically what we're situation. exactly, and we we teach the four A's of survival. Um, our crime prevention team teaches it. We teach it in our shooting class. We we if we go to the Rotary Club, we're we're talking about the four A's of survival because we want it to become second nature to our citizens. And and as I said before, you know, violent crime, a violent criminal is going to take your life in a second. We want to be there. We're responding the moment we know about it. But you got to be ready. You got to be ready to defend. And so all this all this crap that people talk about, you know, uh, people don't need guns and everything else. Man, you know what? That that I can show you countless incidents where people with guns have saved their lives and saved others. Well, the media don't uh, put that information out there. It's Well, of course not, because it, yeah, it doesn't play into their narrative. It doesn't play into their attack on our Second Amendment. Um, and, and anybody that doesn't realize the Second Amendment's under attack is just not paying attention because our Second Amendment is under attack. And in fact, um, Chris, our entire constitution is under attack. I agree. And we, we have to... Um, uh, understand that if the four corners of that document falls, we as a nation fall. Now, I know Florida is a gun-friendly state. Oh, yeah. How easy is it to obtain a firearm in Florida? So, you know, if you, if you have a concealed carry permit, um, you can go to, the, go to the store and buy the gun um, and, uh, and, and be able to leave. Um, I'll give you an example of how difficult it, it, it is. And, and I say that not that it's a bad situation with the firearms manufacturer, the firearms dealers or anything, but there are, there are situations in place to make sure that we're not having someone that's having a mental health breakdown, somebody that's you know, mad at their spouse that's going to buy a gun specifically for that. So I'm a law enforcement officer. And in the state of Florida, if I go today to buy a handgun, um, I, I have to wait three days to be able to get that. And a lot of people go, well, you're a law enforcement officer, you carry a gun every day. I do, but I don't have a concealed carry permit. Now, the reason I don't have a concealed carry permit is I've been a cop since I was 18 years old, so I've never needed one. But if I, if I wanted to avoid that three days, I go get a concealed carry permit and then I can walk in. It's funny, my wife and I will often go gun shopping together and uh, um, she's, a, she's a redhead and I always tell people redheads shouldn't be able to have guns, but she has more than I do actually. So, um, but uh, 
she uh, she has a concealed carry permit, so we can go in and she can walk out with her gun, and I have to go back three days later to get mine. But Florida, you know, Florida is very cognizant of the fact that we want our citizens to be able to protect themselves, and that's Governor DeSantis screams that from the rooftops, and you know, it really comes down to government's one and only responsibility is to protect its citizens. Well, there's no better way to protect your citizens than allowing them to be prepared to protect themselves. Do you have an open carry permit? You know, we don't. Um, up until 1987, Florida was an open carry state. In 1987, they, they legislation passed to give um, a concealed carry where you could get a concealed carry permit. There was a flaw in the, in the, uh, the writing of the law. And so they, they called legislators back into session and their quick fix to that was to do away with open carry and go to just concealed carry. We are working right now. Governor DeSantis has been very vocal that he supports open carry. Um, I've been supporting it, working with um, uh, uh, the different entities out of Tallahassee and across the country to get us to open carry. And I think we'll get there. Uh, there have been some major roadblocks to it. Uh, one of those roadblocks has been the lobbying crew from Disney. Uh, who has fought it tooth and toenail. I think they've learned the lesson now of, of getting involved in politics. They need to stick with entertaining uh, guests and not get involved in politics. Let law enforcement and our legislators deal with that. Yeah. But um, they, um, they've been a big roadblock to it. But uh, we, I think we have the right legislative mindset now to be able to pass it. And, you know, 45 other states have some form of open carry, whether it's permit open carry or constitutional carry. And, you know, there's only five states that don't have it, California, South Carolina, Illinois, New York, and Florida. And I don't want to be in the company of any of those other states. Uh, I want us to, to be in the company of great states like Tennessee and Texas and those that have gone to uh, uh, a form of open carry. Well, I, I just want to be crystal clear that, you know, so, so my readers know, my listeners know that in Florida, people are going through the same background checks as you are in any other state. It's right. just your, you know, your process is a lot smoother. It is. And, uh, you know, you, you have to go through, if you want a concealed carry, you have to get a concealed carry permit. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think we're, we're moving, uh, you know, originally I think the form we were going for was permit um, uh, open carry where, if you had a, a concealed carry permit, you could also carry open. But as I see it moving now, I think it's going to constitutional carry. I think uh, people understand that our citizens have the right and the need to protect themselves. And also that, you know, gun owners are responsible. They, they train with their guns. They have the right holsters for their guns. They're, they're you know, a lot of people say it'll be the wild, wild west. And yeah. I, I'll tell you a funny story, Chris. I was, um, I was in Tennessee with my daughter. We were in a gun store there. And uh, we, uh, we were on vacation and we're in, we're in the gun store. And I'm actually at the time dealing with the legislature and, and working with uh, the NRA and the Unified Sportsmen to try and um, uh, push open carry through. And the guy that was working in the gun store, you know, of course, everybody in there had, you know, guns on and open carry. And I said, hey, I, said, I already knew the answer. I said, hey, I said, you guys have open carry up here, right? And he looks at me and goes, no, man, you can't walk around with a beer in your hand up here. They'll put you in jail. <laughs> and I, I thought that was just the funniest thing because to him, that's what I was talking about, where to us. And so it's not the wild, wild west. It's not any of that. It is good American citizens being prepared to fight evil if that should arise. It's a deterrent, plain and simple. If they say it is. They're not going to do it. Yeah. Now, where do you stand on over? Uh, yeah. You know, Chris, one of the things that I tell everybody is. Good. I'm sorry, I lost you for just a second there. Oh, OK. Uh, no, continue, please. Yeah, I got you back. Now. Yeah. So one of the things that I tell people that say it'll be the wild, wild west or it, it's not effective is do this. Go to your search engine, whether it's Google or whatever it is, go to your search engine and search pawn shops that have been robbed. And what you will find is none of them. Nobody's going in a pawn shop and rob them when everybody in there has got a gun on their hip. Um, you might find where they threw a brick through the window at three o'clock in the morning and broke into the place, but you're not going to find where they went in there and physically robbed them. Go and, go and use your search engine to search fights at the gun show. Zero, no. not a one. You know why? Because it's a level playing field. And when the criminal sees it's a level playing field, 
they go victimize someone else. So, um, you know, I want our citizens to have the ability to, if they want to go on church on Sunday morning, they want to wear a jacket over their gun. I want them to have that ability. If they want to, if they're coming out of the movie theater at 10 o'clock at night and they're walking into a, a dimly lit parking lot, I want them to have the ability to open carry where that evil person sees that it's a level playing field. I agree. Now, where do you stand on national reciprocity? I love it. I, um, I, I want our citizens not to have to worry about going from one state to the other. I, I would love to see us have a universal um, plan that allows everybody, you know, even right now, people say, well, I have a concealed carry in Florida. Can I go to Minnesota? Can I go here? And, and of course, we tell them to go to some of the, the uh, virtually active um, uh, sites that will tell you how they interact with each other. But I'd love to see it at a national level. Uh, yeah, you're going through the same background checks in every state. There's no reason why it shouldn't be. Exactly. Yeah. When when anything in this this world that we go to, if we're consistent in it, it will be a seamless delivery of services. Now, um, you have a few series. Uh, what are they? YouTube series. Um, there are uh, most uh, most of our stuff is on YouTube. It's on uh, uh, social media from. Uh, Instagram, also uh, Facebook. We have a tremendous Facebook following. We're blessed, not only our community, but people from all over the world follow us on our Facebook page. It's Brevard County Sheriff Official. And um, we do some very unorthodox stuff. And I see you laughing because you've already looked at some of it, you know. So <laughs> yes, <I> um, <laughs> we, we have fun and we put bad people in jail and then we don't apologize for it. That's, uh, hey, you're doing what you're supposed to do. Uh, there's no reason why you can't enjoy what you do also. That's, that's exactly right. If you're having fun at work, you'll be successful. You'll also be productive and you'll have a great healthy career. So I, I tell our team when I swear them in, I want you to do four things for me. I want you to come to work and have fun. I want you to put bad people in jail. I want you to do it more professionally than anybody else. And I want you to go home safe. If they do those four things, I'll do everything else for them. Now, what's uh, Major Juni's uh, position uh, in the department? So Major Judy is actually, uh, he's probably the most beloved dog you've ever seen in a community. Um, I'm not sure our chief deputy loves him so much because if you look at our website, uh, it's got the sheriff's information and then it's got Major Judy, um, our, uh, my big bloodhound. But um, our community loves him. He's actually named after a little boy that in 1991 was abducted and murdered here in our community. So he's, uh, he's pretty iconic. Um, he is a... Uh, He's a 150 pound bloodhound and uh, I would show him to you right now, but he's over in the corner sleep. Um, and I'm surprised you can't hear him snoring because I can hear him. So, <laughs> but uh, he's, he's a great dog. He's trained to search for missing children, seniors with dementia, Alzheimer's. He's also a child comfort dog. And then he's our agency mascot, but he, he goes everywhere I go, Chris. Now you set up a um, uh, system for child abduction that's used nationally. Uh, can yeah. you tell us something about that? Sure. When I was with the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, um, we had had a, an abduction in Fort Myers, a young, a young lady by the name of Carla Brucia. And um, what, what happened in that abduction is, you know, when you have a child abduction, you have the, the first hour, 44% of them are killed within the first hour. So in all likelihood, mom and dad probably don't even know they're missing before, unfortunately, they've met um, uh, their death. So when, when you look at the next window of opportunity, it's the three-hour window. And so what we started doing was after we watched the Carla Brucia case unfold, they had thousands of resources. People flooded there to try and help. People wanted to, to do everything they could to save the little girl. Well, what we started doing is looking at how do you manage all those resources? You know, sometimes having an abundance of resources becomes a little bit of burden because you're trying to figure out what to do with all of them and how you can best utilize them. So what we did was we put those resources together in a pre-trained, um, pre-set team so that we had all trained together beforehand. We had all had specific assignments. The sex offender registration team was on one assignment. The canines had another assignment. The mounted patrol had another assignment. On and on and on. Somebody for logistics, everything else. So we put it together. I was working for the Florida Department of Law Enforcement at the time, and uh, we put it together and what we, what we did was really change the game about how child abductions are investigated. Uh, what we call the child abduction response team 
actually took off, became well-known throughout the country. And now when you have a child abduction, that cart team, as we would call it, is being called out, being activated, and each person's got a set responsibility they're, they're working. Um, it has already saved countless lives. Uh, those that um, they didn't get to in time, uh, they were able to garner evidence to be able to put the perpetrator away. Um, so the team is, you know, when you look back on your career, I've been doing this 42 years now, when you look back and you think about things that you were involved in, that you were blessed to have a part in, that save lives, that changed the way, um, that's one of them I'll always look back on and know that we saved somebody's life. In fact, we saved countless lives of that. 42 years. How do you do 42, 42 years? Uh, how do you do 42 yes, uh, years in law enforcement? <laughs> so 42 years is still going. I love it, man. I'm, uh, I'm going to run for another term after this one. And I, uh, I, I get up every day. I can't wait to put this uniform on. And uh, like I said, man, I, I, I believe that my job, my task is to protect our citizens, which our team does so well. Uh, protect our cops. That's my job is to protect our team. If, if they do wrong, I'll put the toe of my shoe in their butt. But if they do it right, I'm going to stand up for them and I'm going to let everybody know they did it right. And then the other part of it is protecting our constitution, which is probably more paramount now than any time before in our, our history. I couldn't agree with you more. I appreciate everything you do, not just for the people in Florida, but uh, for the rest of the country. And um, thank you for taking the time to speak to us today. Oh, it was an honor, man. Anytime you, you think of something else, you call me or I'd love to come back. Oh, I'll definitely have you back on. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chris. Thanks again. I'm just...